Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Morantis, where we break down the week's news on Kubernetes, the cloud native landscape, and the wider world of tech. I'm Eric Gregory, and I'm rolling solo this week because, and this is not a joke, Nick's internet connection was cut off with a backhoe. When he complains about rural broadband, he's really not kidding. Nick will be back with us next week, but for today, I'll be talking about some big news here at Morantis, an upstart C++ successor out of Google, emerging language trends in malware, and a new report on the cyber threat landscape in 2022, now that we're halfway through the year. Let's get right to it. So to start off today, we have to turn the camera back on ourselves for some Mirantis news. Yesterday, our CEO, Adrian Iano, announced that Mirantis is acquiring Amazie.io, the application delivery hub for Kubernetes. Amazie are the team behind the open source Lagoon project, and if you haven't checked it out already, you should really do yourself a favor and open a new tab immediately. Lagoon sets out to solve the universal problem of developers building apps for Kubernetes. You're building your containerized apps and services locally, and now you have to get them across the yawning abyss between the real world and Kubernetes to run the exact same way in production on your cluster. Put simply, it's designed to let developers be developers and focus on code rather than wrenching their work into YAML manifests, using persistent volume claims to request storage and all of that. They can just deploy. Quoting from our press release, Lagoon has been a big daily time saver for the team by allowing us to develop and test many different branches simultaneously by providing us with a quick and easy way to spin up and tear down individual test environments, said Corna Delu, Director of Development at Smartsheet. The ability to create these environments with very little effort directly from branches in our repository has reduced operations effort and allowed our developers and QA engineers to work side by side on any number of different features without negative impact to one another. And now we have another quote starting within the press release. It seems very wrong that today most developers must first go through the pain of learning Kubernetes before they can even deploy a single line of code into Kubernetes. We've taken away that pain, said Michael Schmidt, Chief Technology Officer, Amazie.io. The trick behind Lagoon is that it runs in Kubernetes and works with popular tools like Helm, Prometheus, Grafana, and many others, while it does not require any knowledge of Kubernetes for developers. We've been talking a lot uh, here on the show about our zero ops approach and philosophy lately. Zero ops means an organization doesn't have to worry about their infrastructure, and in our vision, doesn't even have to worry about how to deploy to that infrastructure. They can just focus on doing the cool things that bring them value. Amazie and Lagoon are big new pieces of that puzzle, and we're all thrilled to welcome the Amazie team on board. All right, turning the spotlight back outward again, there's been a lot of chatter this week about a new experimental language from Google called Carbon, which sets out to succeed C++. Now, an important caveat here. When we say this is from Google, it's really from a group of Google engineers. At his unveiling presentation at the CPP North conference, Google engineer Chandler Carruth said that by the end of the year, the team behind Carbon would like contributions from any single company, including Google, to be less than 50%. They'd ultimately like to see it go to an outside organization, and they want their governance model to follow the example of Kubernetes. So why does C++ need a successor? Carruth points to challenges both technical and organizational. According to a lengthy Markdown document explaining the reasoning behind the project, the major drivers are decades of technical debt in C++, hard limitations to the development of C++ given its prioritization of backward compatibility with C, and a slow and bureaucratic committee process. The Carbon team has a pretty specific use case in mind here. This is really intended for organizations that have big C++ code bases, like, say, Google. Those sorts of teams might want to move their big hunks of code to a language with more modern features like generics and a package manager and greater memory safety. But it would be daunting to migrate to something like Rust, which doesn't look a lot like C++ and would require pretty comprehensive rewrites. Carbon is framed specifically as a successor to C++, like Swift to Objective-C or TypeScript to JavaScript or indeed C++ to C. While Carbon is not constraining itself to backward compatibility, it's aiming to make a migration from C++ relatively straightforward. So this has attracted a lot of attention and comment, and even designers behind several relevant languages have waved in, weighed in. Describing himself as, quote, subtweeting hard, unquote, Swift co-designer Doug Greger said, I don't think any programming language unveiled in 2022 should lack memory safety. We have to move on from the it must be as fast as unsafe C mindset because the engineering cost of unsafe by default is so very high. Nice syntax and whiz bang features don't make up for it. Now you might say, hey, wasn't memory safety one of Carbon's goals? 
And the answer is mm, kind of. Quote, practical safety and testing mechanisms, unquote, come forth in the priority list with this explanation. Our goal is to add as much language level safety and security to carbon as possible using a hybrid strategy to balance other goals. We will do as many safety checks as we can at compile time, unquote. So language like practical and as much as possible, those are definitely asterisks. Performance is pretty explicitly the overriding priority here, along with interoperability with C++. Now, Gregor goes on to say, it takes an enormous amount of effort to bring a new language into the world and make it useful, to port code, re-implement core libraries. If you aren't getting safety out of it, why incur the cost? Is the end result actually better or just more pretty? Meanwhile, DevClass asked C++ creator Bjorn Stroestrup what he made of Carbon's announcement, and he responded, quote, there are always new languages trying to be successors to C++. I welcome experiments with programming languages and programming styles, but don't really want to fuel controversies. It is easy to criticize established languages. We know their problems, but typically hard to provide alternatives with, without creating whole new sets of problems in language rules, libraries, and governance. Carbon is so new and underspecified that I can't really make meaningful technical comments." Unquote. You can just feel Strustrup going to pains to be diplomatic in his response, uh, and it's somehow more brutal for that, that last line. <laughs> so we'll keep watching the project, and time will tell how Carbon develops and what kind of adoption it sees. I I've got to respect the specificity of the use case here, but I'd also really like to see higher prioritization of memory safety, especially if the goal here is to use this for large-scale code-based migrations. So we'll see where it goes. For our next story... Well, I suppose churn in language world is sort of a theme today. The last couple of weeks have seen some talk about BUN, an early stage JavaScript runtime developed by Jared Sumner. In the project's own words, quote, BUN is a modern JavaScript runtime like Node or Dino. It was built from scratch to focus on three main things. Start fast, it has edge in mind. New levels of performance, extending JavaScript, score, JavaScript core, the engine. Being a great and complete tool, bundler, transpiler, package manager. So you might ask, why do we need another JavaScript runtime? Node is used all over the place, and Dino is Node creator Ryan Dahl taking a second at bat to fix some of Node's rough edges, not to mention the zillion other runtimes you could use. The big argument here is speed. You can see kind of over to the right here, the figures from the BUN website. We have server-side rendering of React with HTTP requests per second, and we've got 48,936 for BUN running at version 0 0.1 compared to 16,288 for Node or 15,786 for Dino. So massive, massive increase in speed. You see the same thing uh, with BUN running SQLite. So BUN achieves these kinds of results with a runtime written largely from scratch in Zig. And the speed carries over to the package manager, which vastly outperforms NPM, all while being compatible with most of the Node ecosystem. And all of that's pretty much necessary since we're in a place where a big site just kind of can't use NPM and React in production without some janky hacks because they're so slow. So to me, the really interesting thing here is the emphasis on edge. Not only does Bun start fast, but it has a super fast implementation of SQLite 3 built right in. We've got standard web APIs like Fetch and WebSocket built right in, ready to go. It's early days, but Bun feels like a natural citizen of the cloud native world, and I'm excited to spend more time with it. Okay, these last two stories, we've considered some language and runtime alternatives through the lens of ordinary workaday development, but you know, sometimes it's good to shift the frame a little bit and get a fresh perspective. So let's take a journey to the world of malware. This week, security firm Cybel published a report on the Luca Stealer malware, which extracts data from a laundry list of targets like Chromium-based browsers, Telegram, Steam, Discord, and a bunch of browser extensions like 1Password and various crypto wallets. Not great and tough to mitigate against. At this point, Cybel's recommendation for companies is basically to exercise good cybersecurity hygiene. Don't download files from untrusted sources or open random email attachments. Turn on automatic software updates, change up your passwords, etc., etc. But the more interesting aspect of this story is how the malware was built using Rust. Cybel spends a fair amount of time on this in their analysis, noting that, quote, Rust is rapidly becoming one of malware developers' most preferred programming languages because of its versatility and evasion capabilities, unquote. 
In their own article on Lucas Dealer, the register notes that one benefit of Rust for malware developers is that many security engineers and tools don't really understand it yet. They're not as practiced in detecting its tells or reverse engineering it. Some existing malware projects are migrating to Rust, in addition to new tools like Lucas Dealer cropping up. The register spoke with Casey Bassan from code security firm Blue Bucket, who said, quote, the combination of developer convenience, capability, and performance will make it an increasingly common development platform for new threats. The novelty of the platform could mean that many software scanners are unprepared to recognize threat signatures in binaries generated from Rust. Unquote. So there you have it. If you're looking for a developer-friendly language for performant and stable applications, 9 out of 10 malware devs recommend Rust. For our final story this week, we'll stick with the security beat. Security firm SonicWall released its threat intelligence report for the first half of the year and noted several significant trends. According to the report, cybercrime volume has reduced in past hotspots like the US and UK while rising in Europe and Asia. And that's suggestive of one important theme in this report. Environment and overall context is everything when looking at security trends. For one big example, according to the report, Incidents of ransomware were down 23% worldwide year-to-date against last year, but up 63% in Europe. Similarly, overall, malware attacks were up 11% over the same period, but when you drill down to IoT-specific incidents, you find that IoT malware attacks spiked 77%. Hey, malware is moving to the edge too. And why not with all those tasty, poorly secured, or straight-up manufacturer-abandoned devices out there? The huge boost in IoT malware, along with a healthy 30% rise in cryptojacking attacks, are the primary malfactors behind the overall rise in malware. Following past trends, education was the most commonly targeted industry, followed by government and finance. Presumably the logic there is that education has a soft underbelly while government and finance are higher risk, but ultimately higher reward targets. Finally, the report gives us an update on Log4j exploits. With a little over 60 million exploit attempts in December of 2021, Log4Shell was already the most exploited vulnerability of that year. Month by month, the Sonic Wall report shows these exploits on the rise with over 85 million attempts in June. Quoting from the report, based on current data, we may not see attack volumes fall or even peak anytime soon. According to Dark Reading, more than 40% of the Log4J packages downloaded from early February to early March months after fixed versions of the software became available, were still vulnerable versions. Worse, many instances have remained vulnerable because organizations are simply unaware of them, and sometimes even dependency and analysts can't find them." Unquote. All right, well, on that ominous note, that's it for today. Solo show is often a little short. Our wackadoodle segment will return next week with Nick, but in the meantime, I want to congratulate Don Jin, who won last week. Don Jin will be in touch shortly. I'd also like to thank Nika and Sharla for their production magic week on week and all of y'all for turning in, tuning in. Radio Cloud Native is recorded live every Wednesday and you can find us in podcast form wherever fine podcasts are purveyed. Take care and see you next week.